Hey everyone, this is John Puritz. Welcome to the Man Up Already podcast. This show is dedicated to each of us being better in all areas of our lives, mentally, spiritually, physically, and relationally. We want to help you be a better you because when you man up already, the world around you is greatly impacted. Here on the podcast, we don't believe you're an accident. We believe each of us is created for purpose and this show is dedicated to helping you discover and live out that purpose. Again, welcome to the show and let's check out another great episode. All right, everyone. Hey, welcome back to another great episode of the Man Up Already podcast. As always, super pumped to have you here. Got another, another incredible guest, super pumped to bring him up. But before we do, just want to thank all of you for, for being on here, um, for, for being faithful to the missions of the mindset. We're going to kind of open things up a little bit more as we go forward. I think we've been pounding the drum on manhood uh, <clears throat> and um, things that are kind of going on with that. Uh, but I think, you know, getting back into some things that, you know, are uh, what we like to say, success principles being success principles and how do we just continue to get better? You know, we're recording this here in the month of August. And, you know, before we know it, we're going to be in the last four months of the year, we're going to be throttling to the end. And what better way to start your, your you know, 2024, if you can believe it, right, by by really making some changes on the back end of the year. How do you want the year to finish? What do you want to do? Setting some goals, laying some things in place, foundationally, structurally, that we can use to just continue to get better and better. And one way we want to help you do that is manupalready.com. We continue to grow that out. But on there, if you go to the website, right on the front page, um, you can get a free chapter, my favorite chapter of the book, Man Up Already, which is The Power of Your Posse, um, just by joining our mailing list. So go to manupalready.com, join our emailing list, because we're going to be letting you know of a lot of things happening, sharing resources, and we want to keep in touch with you. Um, also, the latest podcast episodes are up on manupalready.com, so it continues to grow, and we'd love to to see you there and stay in communication with you. So, Without further ado, I'm excited to bring up our guest today. Um, he is a retired lieutenant colonel of the U.S. Army. He's an author, uh, the author of Your Leadership Legacy, Becoming the Leader You Were Meant to Be. He's an incredible speaker. Um, we met and connected and uh, had a conversation. I said, man, we got to get you on the podcast. So I'm super pumped to bring up my new friend, Oakland McCulloch, to the Man Up Already podcast. Hey, John, oh, how are yeah, you? Man. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm doing awesome. Glad to have you. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this. Oh, well, that's uh, I'm humbled by that for sure. For sure. You know, I, I, I loved, you know, there's something about for me when I get to connect with men that have had a career or have spent time in the armed services. I'm one of those guys that uh, I, I wonder if if I could, you know, way back when. I, I was so undisciplined. I was disciplined, but undisciplined. Like I was in a rock band, right? So like the <laughs> antithesis of the, the service, you know what I mean? Was being, you know, a long haired rock and roller. But, you know, as a, as a father, as a husband, as a man today, I, I have recognized so many attributes and qualities that come from serving. Right. Um, and, and I am in, um, I'm humbled by it in awe in a lot of it of the mindset. I love, I love listening to, you know, guys that have been in the service, like SEAL teams and all that. And what's the mindset to overcome adversity, press forward, commit yourself to something bigger. So when we connected, I was jacked up to just spend some time with you. Yeah, absolutely. Me too. I, I, th I think, you know, it, it, I am certainly where I am in my life today because of the military, no doubt about it. Um, I think I went in with some discipline, but it certainly helped me develop some self-discipline, which, uh, you know, that's the key. There's a huge difference between self-discipline and discipline. And, you know, the self-discipline is the key to success in life, in my, in my opinion, because that's when you get to the point where you do things because it's the right thing to do not because somebody's making you do it or because somebody's going to check up on you or watching you, but because it's the right thing to do. You know, I, I'm, it, it's, it's funny because as somebody who, I mean, I joke that I was undisciplined, but if you, if you boiled me down, right, there was, there was self-discipline because sure. it's, it's the only way that you can, you can continue to move forward. 
Um, but I'm always shocked to hear stories of, you know, guys that were kind of, you know, they, they needed the discipline of the military, but they didn't have that self-discipline, nor did they, you know, I've heard many stories where they didn't find it there either. Like, I think the thing, I'd love to talk about that a little bit to just kind of dive in deep. Um, what's your take on, you know, I speak a lot on how important self-concept is, right? Like having a strong self-worth, self-value. Right. And I don't think that happens without discovering the discipline to push through hard things. So maybe you could just share your thoughts on on how important that yeah, is. I, absolutely. So, you know, I, I was an athlete all my life. I played baseball, basketball, football in high school. And I think that helped me with what you're talking about, you know, pushing yourself beyond where you think you can go. And I always use an example as a high school kid, I, you know, I grew up in Northern Illinois working on farms all summer. And when it would come to two a day football practices, I'd go to football practice in the morning. I'd go bale hay in the, in the early afternoon. And then I'd go back for a second session of football. And, you know, that kind of showed me, helped me push myself beyond where I thought maybe physically I could do and go. And then, and then the other piece of that was I was, always the captain of my team. So I was pushed mentally to help develop other players and help the team be the best it could be. And I think that's where I learned, I started to learn the concept of, of uh, selfless service and servant leadership where it wasn't just about me. Um, and I think that helped me a lot. It also helped me develop the, like my concept that it isn't about you. It's about the team. It's about mm. the organization that you're a part of. Um, and I had somebody tell me the other day, use the analogy, analogy, analysis or the, um, said, look, you're just a piece in the puzzle. You might be a big piece in the puzzle if you're the star athlete or whatever, but you're still just a piece because the puzzle's incomplete if everybody isn't part of that puzzle. Yeah, it's... It's so funny because literally this morning I was having a conversation about just that with a with a friend and teammate of mine. We're putting together a rock band of all things, you know, and um, and I said, you know, everybody's we're a team and teams teams function in a certain way. And and and, and when one person isn't communicating and when you don't know what's going on, the team stops. Right. Because right. you can't move forward when that cog in the wheel or the machine is not, is not functioning, you know, properly. Um, so it, it's just so funny that you say that because it's literally happening. It happens everywhere. It's, it's that. Important. Yeah, it does. I, you know, I, I, as I go around and talk to, cause I, you know, I go around and not only give a talk on leadership, but I also go around to companies and, and organizations that ask me to come for a day or whatever, and just put a new set of eyes on things. And one of the things I always figure out is that communication isn't good. Usually people thinks it's good, but it's not. And the other piece of it is, is that not everybody feels like they're a, pe a part of the team or a valued part of the team. You know, and I, I was talking to a football team at one of the universities here in the local area. And, and the coach had mentioned that he felt that was a problem. And, and the, the kind of the, not the bickering, but the, the hard feelings about the people who are on the practice team versus the people who are on the starting team and, and I said to him, I said, look, I don't care if you're on the starting team or you're on the practice team. You are just as valuable to this team as anybody else, as each other. Because those of you on the practice team, your job is to prepare those on the first team to be ready for that game next week. And if you don't do a good job playing the part, pushing those people, then they're not going to be the best they can be come Saturday when they play in that game. So don't think that your, your part of this isn't just as important as theirs. And eventually, if you do your job well on the practice team, you'll probably end up on the first team at some point. But, but everybody's part is important, and you got to make sure that people understand that, that, that they're important. And part of the way to do that is to communicate well with people why their part is important and make sure they understand it. There's a couple of things <clears throat> in what you just said that I want to kind of dive a little on. Number one, and it's amazing to me, I think I think you would agree, the biggest breakdown in relationships, anything where, you know, I mean, look, when somebody says, you know, 
I don't want to deal with people. Well, good luck, right? Because there's a lot of them on the planet, right? <laughs> That's life, <laughs> right? So you have to be good. I think those that success in it have success in anything in life and, you know, career, whatever relationships, you have to get good with people. You have to, un, you know, you have to understand how important relationships are and working as a team. But I think the number one thing that can sabotage all of that is what you said, communication. Right. Right. And, and being authentic, I, you know, I just, how often do we not say anything, avoid something? I mean, it's happening in my family right now, not in my home, but you know, in my family where lack of communication or too much communication, right? Like somebody said just something and it just was like, you know, declaring war, you know what I mean? Right. Like we got to think about what we're saying. We got to think about how we communicate. Communication is so, so, so important. Absolutely is. I, I just had this conversation the other day with somebody. I said, look, you got to be honest with people. Like you said, you got to be authentic. You, you got to be honest with people, but you also have to think about what you're about to say. Because I always tell people, look, once you say it, it's it, you can't unsay it. It's out there. Mm -hmm. And so you got to really be careful what you're saying, especially in in personal relationships, um, because that will come back to haunt you. I promise you. <laughs> you oh, know, there's a reason I've been happily married for 36 and a half years, because <laughs> I understand that, you know, and that doesn't mean that my wife and I aren't very honest with each other because we are. But we stop and think before we open our mouths and say something that we're going to regret. What have you learned? I think this is just a good opportunity. 36 years. I got 10 years. I'm 10 years behind you. Um, but I, and I've learned a lot about communication Absolutely. with my wife, but I know that you have 10 years more of lessons that you can share. Um, 36 years married is, is, is a, an incredible thing. So what would you say for our married men out there or married people out there? Cause it's men and women that listen. What's the, what are some key takeaways that, that you yeah. would, you would, you know, impart. Yeah. So I, th I think one of the things is you, you gotta, you gotta spend time together. You know, you really have to set aside some time. And, and sometimes that's been hard in, in our marriage, you know, being in the army, being deployed for six months, a year at a time away from, you know, a month at a time in the field, whatever it was. And so I got that, you know, we, we all have obligations. We all have things that we can't say no to that. We're going to have to be away. We're going to miss a birthday. We're going to miss an anniversary, whatever that is. But, and, and it always kills me when a four-star general gets up on the stage and tries to, t and, and starts talking about work-life balance and how that's the key to life. And I said, yeah, that, right. That's how you made four stars. I got it. Yeah. Right. But the way I take work-life balance is this is that when you can be home, because there's times when you can't be and you're going to miss things, when you can be home, you got to take advantage of that. And you have to dedicate <clears throat> be that home. time. Right. You have to be home. That's right. And you got to dedicate that time to your your spouse and your kids and whoever else that needs needs it there in the, in the household. And so I think that's part of it is you got to really dedicate time to get to know people and your, your spouse and be there for them. Then the communication piece, obviously, uh, is is huge. And I think that you really do. You have to be honest um, with each other. And if something's bothering you about that, you know, my wife has no problems telling me when I'm doing something that's bothering her. And that's OK, because how are you going to fix it if, if you don't know? And I think that's one of the big problems in relationships is people are afraid to to tell somebody that something's bothering them. And it just keeps building and building and building to the point where it can't be fixed. So. I think that's that's part of it as well. And, you know, I you I really like my wife. I like being with her. I like spending time with her. And so I think that that's that's key is that you just got to spend time and grow together, not apart. You know, there's and there's a lot of wisdom there. And I, I think the one thing that I've learned in our marriage, I mean, everything that you just said is dead on. And, and th those are the keys, right? Spending time, liking your spouse, communicating. Um, you said something, right? We can't be afraid to tell our spouse, right? How we feel, right? That's if right. something's bothering me, being able to communicate it. I think what I've learned also is not being afraid to hear something that we may not like. Yeah. 
right? And not getting mad at the person for saying it, but actively listening. And, and because there's something in there that we can fix. And it all, all the way goes back to what you talked about, self-discipline, having the desire to be better, right? That's and having right. the discipline to say, hey, maybe I'm doing something that's ticking her off or, you know, ticking him off. And I, I, I probably could grow here. I, I agree. And I think you hit the key, right? Up, hit something key right on the head. And that's listening. And we don't, we as humans don't do a good job of listening. Most of the time we listen just enough that we can figure out what we want to say in response. We're not really listening to learn what it is that somebody's trying to tell us. And I think in a relationship that is huge. You really do have to listen, you know, and, and I always use, use this. I say, you know, going back to don't be mad when somebody tells you something that you don't want to hear. You know, if you shoot the messenger, messengers are start going to stop coming. No, that's you true. know, you got to be receptive to to even bad, you know, bad criticism or criticism of something that you're doing that isn't the best version of yourself. And you got to be willing to fix it if you really want this relationship to work. You know, I put a post out there today. Um, stop, stop short circuiting the plan. And you know, in my outside of the podcast, right, I'm a financial advisor. And, and one of the things that I see that's that keeps people from hitting their goals is how they how they think. Right. But I think that applies that that desire to to grow, to get better. The the. You know, if, if you're going to grow in your marriage, right, as an example, the, the only way to grow in that marriage, I mean, 36 years is a, is a big deal. And I got to believe that you had to change your mindset on some things and had to be willing, right? You, I can't keep thinking the same way if I want this to last a long, a long time, right? We constantly have to learn new things and be, and that's where active listening comes, but listening from a space of, all right, something's, there's something here that I can learn. I love what you just said. If you don't, if you're closed off, guess what? I think I think the universe kind of hits pause and waits for you to learn that lesson before you can can move over. Time will continue going on, right? right. But growth and all and reality it just kind of stops and stays the same until we learn the lesson. Yeah, I mean, you know that the old adage that the only thing that's constant is change is absolutely mm -hmm. true. I mean, we're all going to have to change in everything we do to get better. You know that's the only way you're going to get better is to make changes. Cause if you keep doing things the same way that you've always done them, you're going to get the same result right. period guaranteed. You've got to be willing to change and you've got to be willing to change as a couple. If you're talking about a, a, a relationship, because every change you make changes, not only you, but also changes the relationship as well. And some of that is for the good and some of it's for the, not for the good. And, the things that aren't good for the relationship, then that's when the honesty has to come out and somebody's got to say, wait, that's that's not really what we need to be doing. And and you got to be receptive to that. You've got to say, OK, if I want to be the best I can be, then I've got to learn some things, you know, and, and my father taught me that as a as a young man. He he growing up, he had this thing in, in our in my life. He used to call it the 75 percent rule. And he and he w said, you will always want to be the best at whatever you can do. He said, I don't care if you're sweeping floors. You want you want to be the best floor sweeper there is. He said, and my rule is this. If you can't be better than 75 percent of the people doing it, then you need to do one of two things. You either need to figure out how to get better change or you need to go find something else to do because it obviously it doesn't matter to you. Mm. And I kind of grew up with that rule. And I've lived by that rule and I tried to pass it on to my kids and I'm hopefully I'm passing it on to my grandkids. But I think that it goes back to being wanting to be the best you can be at whatever it is you are, whether it's a husband, a, a father, uh, a officer in the army, a financial advisor, whatever it is, you should want to be the best at whatever it is you're doing. I love that. That's so I love it because it's so simple, right? It's just, it is in its simplicity, it's a plan, right? Whatever I do, how do I be better than 75% of the people that are doing this? I, 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 so let's dive into that. What are, what would you say are some ways that, that people can do that? Let's say somebody takes stock and goes, sure. you know what? That's a great way I can apply that. Let me, let me do that. 
where would they start? So I think the first thing is you got to figure out what it is you want to be. How do you know, do you want to be whatever it is that you think you want to be? And then you got to sit down and say, okay, if I really want to do this and I want to be the best at it, what are the things I have to do to be the best at whatever it is I'm going to do? And you know what? You already know the answers to that, but, but actually sit down and, and write it out. Okay. If I want to be the best at this, these are the things I have to do. Then you sit down and say, okay, if those are the things I have to do, then where, what do I have to do to do those? Mm -hmm. What training do I have to get? What, what experience do I have to get? Who do I have to talk to? Who do I have to work with? Whether it's a financial advisor or it's a coach or whatever to get better at those things that are going to allow you to be the best at what you want to be. But I think the first thing you got to do is write it down. You know, I always tell people, look, it's not a goal. And there is a difference between a dream and a goal. A dream, it's all, those are nice to have, but dreams are actually worthless unless right. you actually try to put them into reality, which is by using goals. And to be a goal, you have to do three things. You have to write it down because mm -hmm. it, unless you write it down, it's just a dream. In the first 24 hours, you have to do something that starts you down the road to accomplishing that goal. And then you got to commit yourself to that goal. And that's where a lot of people fall short is they, they think that's what they want to do. They say that's what they want to do, but they're not willing to go through the sacrifices and do the hard work to be the best at what they can be to reach that goal. And I think those are the three things that, that you have to do. I love that. And I want to comment on that because, um, I mean, I'm experiencing it just in, in my life as well. I think maturity also, and I think you would agree, and I think this, this shows self-discipline and also leadership uh, in a couple of ways is knowing when not to, like you may have a, a dream, I love, right. Or a goal, but knowing when the right time to, to actually tackle that it, you like, sometimes you can start down the path and it's the wrong time to do so. Right. Right. And then face failure when you weren't very real and authentic to go, I want to accomplish this, but it's not the right time. I'll give you it. And the, re the reason why I'm talking about that is I'm typically like fitness goal, like lunatic, right? Like I, I was so focused on my fitness that I think I burnt myself out. Right. Right. And, and I'm in this space now where I've got a lot, there are a lot of things that need to get taken care of outside of my fitness when it comes to just business and in life, there's a lot being asked. So when I wake up in the morning, like I'm in this space where I know that I, there are things that I need to do to get back on track with my fitness. But I also know that if I start, because I know what it's going to take discipline wise, I'm going to fail. And I don't, I, I'm going to, I'm going to be okay in this space for like, so I'm doing certain things like I'm inter intermittent fasting and doing all that, making sure I cut down, right. The amount of, you know, bad crap I'm putting in my body and all that to kind of counteract the fact that I'm not working out the way I normally would. But I know that when I commit to the fitness goal, and have the time and the space to do it, then I'm, I'm going to be ready and I'm going to have results. So I think part of it is knowing and having the maturity to say, who are you doing this for? And That's being right. okay to say, because I remember I said to my friend, you know, he had this great post and it was, you know, all this great. And, and I said, great post. He said, you know, we're committed and I love him. I've had him up. It's Clint uh, and Suzette Murray. I've had them on the podcast. And, and I said, it's awesome content. I'm one of the guys you're talking to. I'm just not ready yet. <laughs> and right. His response was, I'm ready when you're ready. You're like, like, it's not a no. It's just having the wisdom and the maturity to say, I'm not ready just yet, but I'm getting it. Yeah, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, again, that goes back to the initial reflection of what is it do I really want to do? And can I get there at this point in my life? And I'll give you an example. I, I knew I always wanted to write my book. I, 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 it's been a dream of mine to write that leadership book. And, and I, I, I just wasn't ready. And then one day I went to my wife and I and her mom and two people that live in our condo, we went to a motivational speaking slash, how do we grow the Catholic church event at our church? And there was a great speaker there and it was a three hour long event. And 
Now he didn't speak all three hours. He spoke for 40 minutes and then we took like, you know, a break and then did different things. And he'd come back and he'd speak for 40 minutes. So he spoke for three times for 40 minutes. And each time there was a break, I went up and talked to him because he, he was doing what I wanted to do, get out and speak and, and help influence people to be better people. And he was giving me some great advice. And then at the end, the last time I talked to him, we kind of said, great, thanks, bye. And then he started to walk away and he turned around and he said, Oak, have you written a book? And I said, well, no, Jonathan, but I'm thinking about it. And he turned around and he looked at me and he said, stop thinking about it and write it. Mm. So I just, it was just like I needed permission to do it, you know? And so I went home that night and I started writing the book and less than a year later, I published it. But I was ready at that point. Right. I didn't know I was ready until he kind of pushed me in that direction. And I said, okay, yeah, I am ready to do this now. So you're right. It, it's a, so a lot of that is, are you ready to, to commit to what it is that you want to do? And if you're not, then don't even go down that road because right. you're not going to get there. You got to be ready to commit to it. And it's okay not to be. It is. You know, it, it, I think that's, that's, that's part of having maturity, right? In wisdom is knowing when to and when not to and being okay with that. Like I, I, I often, and I want to talk about your book, but I often think that people do things because they think, that, well, that's how I'm going to be accepted or that's how I can be successful. And they're not fully committed, not fully ready. And then, and then they go down a path and they stop and they fail Right. And, and to me, failure, like I think we overrate what we call failure just because it didn't work at that point doesn't mean it's not going to work. It just That's might right. not have been the right time. There's a That's big right. difference. Or, may, between- or maybe you, you hadn't gotten all the skills that you needed. Again, sit down and think about what it is that you want to be and what it's going to take to get there. And maybe instead of going down that road, maybe you, you come to the conclusion, okay, if I want to do that, then I got to get better at this first. Like you were saying with your health and and with fitness, maybe I'm not ready to do that yet. I got to get better at this before I can do that. Right. So I think it really does come down to sitting down and, and really kind of planning out what it is that you want and how to get there and the things you need to be able to do to get there. You know, one of the things that we talk about here, which is a really universal, is is what we call the seven Fs, which is faith, family, finances, fitness, um, firm is your career, friendships, fun, right? These things that make up what, what we call the wheel of life, right? Yeah, make None, us people. Right. None of those things happen by accident, right? They're, they're, I think some people say, you know, well, I'll pray about it and you know, hope maybe I'll get lucky. Like, it's kind of like playing the lotto. Like, really? That's your plan? Like, none of those things breed success in life without what you're talking about by design, being deliberate, having that discipline. It's not going to come from somewhere else. It always comes from from within. That's right. And And I think, you know, the other piece that you hit that I absolutely agree is that I think some people do things not for themselves, but because they think somebody else wants them to do it or expects them to do it, or that's what somebody else expects of me. That's not a, that's not a good road road to go down. You have to figure out what you want in life, not what somebody else, you know, and, and Colin Powell said, and one of my favorite leaders, um, still the most impressive man I've ever met in person. Mm. One of his quotes was, if you let other people make decisions for you, don't be disappointed when you don't get what you want. Mm, that's good. And so true. <laughs> it's so true. You know, I was, I, I'm like a walking poster child for doing things that other, that I thought other people wanted me to do and convincing we, myself that, that you know, yeah, it just, and in the end, I was again, talking to my friend earlier, that costs you a lot of money, but more importantly, a ton of, a ton of time, yeah. Yep. right? And you can get but the money back, but back. you can't get the time, right? You cannot get the time back. So yep. let's talk about your book, um, your leadership legacy, becoming the leader you were meant to be. So what's the story behind the book? What's the book about? Love to hear more of that. Yeah, so I'm a firm believer in servant leadership. I believe it's not about you. It's about the people and the organization that you have the privilege to lead. And it is a privilege to be able to lead. Um, and my book, uh, you know, it 
no theory in my book at all. You know, I've in my career, 40 plus years of being a leader, I've had plenty of theory classes and learned all that. And that's important and it's good, but that's not what makes you a good leader. I can teach you all the theory in the world and that doesn't mean anything. Mm. My book is about everyday things that every leader can do to help improve not only their leadership and uh, skills and abilities, but also to, to help them understand that it is about the people that they have the privilege to lead. How do you communicate with them? How do you build a team? How do you build trust? How do you build the culture of your organization, which is, in my opinion, probably the most important thing that a leader does is build the culture of that organization. Um, how do you come up with the vision and plan of where you want to get that organization? Um, communication is, is a, I got a chapter on communication, how to communicate with people inside your organization as a leader. And I think, you know, it is a leadership book, but I also think, and I've had people tell me, look, this, even if you aren't a leader, the, the things in this book are things that are going to help you be successful as a person. And I really wanted it to be, I, it, it is not about military leadership. I use a lot of military examples because I spent 23 years at learning things about leadership. But leadership is leadership. Leadership is about people, period. I don't care where you learned how to lead. I don't care where you practiced it. If you can lead people, you can lead any organization. And that a huge piece of that is the trust piece. And people need to trust you if you want them to follow you. And, oh my gosh, this is such a great, it's one of my favorite, you know, conversations. I think so many people say, well, you know, I'm not cut out to be a leader. I don't want to be a leader. But somewhere in our life, we are going to have to lead, right? Whether it's ourself. Whether you have a title of a leader or not. Correct. Correct. Which is why I think self-concept is so important in building, cultivating self-discipline. I think, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent in do hard things because the lessons in doing hard things build that self-worth, self-discipline, self-concept. And then you get, correct. And then you get to share that. And we call that leadership. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, like you, I love what you said. You don't lead in theory. You lead in, people know when you have not done what you say you should do. That's right. Well, you know, I, I use an example, you know, you do not have to have a title of being a leader to be the leader, like on a football team, you don't have to be the captain to be the leader. I, and I, and I was talking to, I I'm lucky. I, I had a coach uh, of one of the local football teams who, kind of took me on and had me help with his leadership of his captains and his team. And he always invited me to the games and I'd go to the games and I'd stand on the sideline and, you know, I'd talk to a couple of them as they'd come up and talk to me or whatever, but the end of the game, they were down on the three yard line, needed a touchdown to win quarterback threw a pass to the receiver and he dropped it and the team lost. And I walked up to, to, to him and I said, I, I, I walked up to him and I said, okay, you messed up this time, but next time you need, we need you. So figure out how to do better next time. And you know what? I had taught you something about not be, having to be the captain. I, I saw about four or five guys walk up to him and tell him the same thing. They weren't the captains. But at that point, they were a leader on that team Mm -hmm. because they were making sure that he felt like he was still part of the team. He made a mistake. Okay, we all make mistakes. Nobody's perfect in this world. Let's do better next time. And I think that's that's the key. You got to you got to be willing to step up when even if you're not the leader by title or by position, you just got to step up when it's needed to take charge of the situation and make it better. You think about that one that one moment, right? Like, and we all have them. We've all had moments in life where we don't catch the winning pass. Yeah. Right. They, or they, make the they, winning shot or right. whatever it is. Right. And I think, you know, we hear all the time it's not, you know, who wins or loses, it's how you play the game. Well, I think there are moments where, like in that case, okay, you, you lost the game, but the lesson wasn't whether you won. The lesson is always in the adversity, right? The key is 
are you going to take the missed catch or whatever it is that we are doing in life and say, I'm going to get better. So when this shows up again, right. I'm ready for that moment. Yep. Absolutely. That is the key. You know, Vince Lombardi said, you know, he had the famous quote that you don't win. Sometimes you win all the time. Well, we don't all win all the time. And he understood that. And another quote of his that kind of went with that is that it, it isn't important if you win all the time. What's important is that you go into it with the desire to win every right. time. And to get when you don't, you figure out what went wrong and how to get better. And I, I'm a firm believer that how you react to failure is is the same that you react to success. Because mm -hmm. I don't care if you were successful, you could still get better. And success or failure, you should look at every opportunity to say, okay, I did this well, I didn't do this well, whichever one it is, but how can I still get better at it? And if you have that mindset, and again, my father taught that to me as a young, young man, that you can always get better. I don't care how good, how good you did, how well you played, how well you did something, you can always get better at it. And if you don't think that, then go do something else because you're probably not going to get any better at it. Yeah, that's, it's so good. I wish, I, I truly wish for our listeners and for, you know, when I'm out there c connecting and communicating, you know, if we saw life as just this journey to, to get better, you know, I really, I truly do. I think the greatest experiences come from, I wasn't that good here, but then I got better, right? I can get better as a husband, wife, parent. I can get better as a friend. I can yeah. get better in my career. I can get better in my hobbies, whatever it is. Like if we're always with that mindset of it's not what you take, right? It's what you certainly give, right? But when you, when you put out the effort, when you give the effort, when you give the desire, when, you, when you're putting out into the universe, the universe really does have a way of giving back. The only the only way to get is is to give. But I think that even that we, we tend to view that as, well, I can give my time and I can give my money. And yes, we can. But can you give, give your desire? Can you give your willingness? Can you give your empathy? It's it's just that mindset of what more can I put out there from an energy standpoint, from right. a, you know, all these things that it comes back and continues to develop and grow us as a person. Yeah, I, I, I agree 100 percent, you know, and right now in the Catholic Church, we're we're kind of all talking about the, <clears throat> this thing called the holy moment. And, you know, the concept is that you go out every day, one one person every day, you go out and make a conscious decision to make a difference in somebody's life, just one person. And we can all do that. Agreed. I mean, that we're not asking. That's not asking a whole lot. That's you find one person and you make a positive difference in their life. And I always tell people, look. Imagine how much better our neighborhood, our community, our town, our state, our country would be, the world would be, if everybody went out and found one person every day and made a positive difference in their life. You know, it, I'm just sitting here going, that's as simple as, and again, it's all disciplines, right? It's like, when, put it, put it, how do you, let, let's pause it for a minute. How do you accomplish big things, right? You accomplish big things by a lot of small things, right? Done over well. Over a period of time. Yeah. Done well over a period of time, right? So every single person listening to this or seeing this could, could literally say, you know what? Every day before I leave the house or every day when I'm at a stoplight, whatever it is, I'm going to pick a person and I'm going to shoot an encouraging text. I'm going to let somebody know I love them. I'm going to let somebody know what I value about them. I'm going to, yeah. right? And you're making a deposit, right? That may be the only message that person gets that day that's positive in their life. That's right. Yeah, and, and my and my wife kind of kind of nailed this for me. You know, she was in the Army as well. She was an Army nurse for eight years. So we're never late for anything. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're always that person that's probably 15, 20 minutes early for things. And so we, we always leave plenty of time, but I figured one day I figured out hey, we're leaving five minutes earlier than we were even before. And we were always early at that point. And I said, why? And she said, because somebody, we might meet somebody in the hallway or in the elevator or in the lobby or in the garage that just needs to talk to us today. Mm. And we might be the only people that they are going to run into and we need to stop and give them our attention and let them talk. 
And I thought, wow. And it's actually happened. You know, it it's actually happened that we ran into somebody and you could just tell they just needed to talk about a problem or a, or maybe something that was good in their life, whatever. Right. But they needed somebody to talk to. So it doesn't have to be anything huge. It can be just giving somebody smiling at somebody at the stoplight. Something positive. Try to make a different positive difference in somebody's life every day. I love that. I love that. And there's, there's so much goodness in the things that you're talking about. Oh, okay. I, I really do love it. You, um, I want to pivot for a minute because I'm just fascinated. You went into the army at, um, in what year? Ni- 1981. And retired when? 2009. And, th- and so- then I ran a food bank for a couple of years um, along the Gulf Coast. So 52 counties along the Gulf Coast of the United States. So Mississippi to the panhandle of Florida. And then I've been a government service officer now for 13 years. So some type of leadership position associated with the army for about 40 years. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, 81 to 09, there's, there's a lot of interesting things that have happened in our world, you know, yeah. During that period, anything you want to, you know, that stood out, you know, from a world well, event yeah, kind of standpoint. Yeah, that, that's that's interesting because people always ask me. They said, you know, I've I've been deployed. I was in the first Gulf War. I was in Bosnia. I was in Kosovo. I've wow. been in forty five countries on five continents. Gotten to do some amazing things. But they say, what's the thing that you're the most proud of <clears throat> that you did, deployment wise or like that? Um, and I always tell them, I was involved in two hurricane relief operations, Hurricane Hugo in Charleston and Hurricane Andrew in South Florida. And to me, that was the most satisfying thing because I was helping people here in the United States that needed help at that point. Mm. And, you know, again, I grew up in the Midwest. I had no idea what a hurricane was. I know what tornadoes are all about. But when I first went, the first time we were driving into Charleston, and I saw the devastation that those hurric- that, that hurricane caused. It, it was just mind blowing. It really was. I, I had no idea the amount of destruction. Now that I live in Florida and I've lived through four or five hurricanes, I got it. I understand. But, yeah. uh, but at that point, I didn't. And, uh, and, and so those, those, that's what I'm really proud of in operations that I've done. And, you know, I talk about legacy. That's part of the name of my book. And somebody asked me the other day, so what does legacy mean to you? And I say, legacy is very small part. It's two pieces. The very small piece is what you actually accomplished, what you did physically. That's results matter in the real world. I got that. And you need to be successful. But the biggest part of your legacy is the leaders that you create that are going to take your place, who are going to create the next generation of leaders, who's going to create the next generation of leaders, because that's your legacy is who you leave behind. And that, that really, I, I had a, a, a master sergeant, David Powell, who worked for me. And I say he worked for me. He was probably a better leader than I was. And we were running the ROTC program at the University of South Alabama, producing the next generation of leaders for the army and for the nation. And one day we were talking about the importance of what we were doing. And he said to me, he said, you know, sir, great nation, great leadership handed down from generation to generation is what develops great nations. And I thought to myself, wow, what a powerful quote. And the most powerful part of that quote is that you can take that word nations and you can substitute anything you want for that family, work corporation, university, sports team, food bank, hospital, doesn't matter because every organization, every part of life needs good leaders. No, it's so so true. that to me is my is what I want my legacy to be is the next generation of leaders that I help produce. No, that's awesome. Love that. Um, I'm going to ask, and I want to make sure it, I'm not it's not a political statement. It's not turning the podcast into anything like that. I, I really genuinely am asking because I just would love somebody who's, you know, fought for this country for 30 years. Do you think we're losing some of that today? We are. Absolutely. I think in, in all, at all levels, government, military, corporations, 
I think we are producing leaders who are not servant leaders, who are in it for themselves. Um, they have forgotten that the reason they are put in leadership positions is to help other people. If that is not why we are put on this earth, then why are we here? I, right. I, I honestly believe that. Now, you know, and I get people all the time who tell me when I tell people that they say, but I want my next promotion. I want my next pay raise. And I tell them, I said, look, if you do this right, if you take care of people and you truly care for people, you're going to get what you want in the end because you're going to make them you're better. You're going to get people. more. You're going to make your organization better and you're going to get credit for it. Good for you. You'll get your promotion. You'll get your pay raise, but you get it for the right reasons. Not because right. you were greedy, but because you helped other people. Well, there's, and I would add, you get actually more than you desired because those are the things that actually expand what I call, right, expanding the universe, right? I, I, I think what you're talking about, right, like if, if I'm in it for me, things contract, right? And one of the things that I teach from a money mindset perspective is if I'm holding on to all I've got, nothing more is coming. That's right. It doesn't right? grow because I'm I'm just like this. If I'm if I'm open, then I'm ready to receive. And the more we we are selfish or self serving, love what you what you said. We're not growing, right? We're shrinking. Yeah. But when you do approach with an openness, with a willingness, when you know, I just had a moment yesterday where there was something that I had to offer that I was uncomfortable offering. But I I just like I remember saying to myself, you can't say this over here and then not apply it over here, right? How you do, well, the mantra of the show is how you do one thing is how you do everything. And right. being able, if you if you do put out in love, in empathy, in care, in discipline, in giving, it has a way of coming back in spades. It does, absolutely. I believe that 100%. Yeah, it's good stuff. Well, I know we could we could, you know, continue going for, for a long, long time, <laughs> um, but, but, you know, I, we gotta land the plane. So, um, how do people find you, Oak? And I know that you're out there speaking. How, you know, how do they get you to come in? Like, you know, what's the best way to get get a hold of you? So I have a website, um, and it, not hard to find. www.ltcoakmacullough.com. Um, and, and on there, it has my cell phone number. It has my email uh, address. All that. If you're interested in having me come talk, I would love to do it. Um, you know, and I, I have a wide variety. I'm not pigeonholed. I don't just talk to military. I don't just talk. I've talked to everything from universities to HR conferences, to fiduciary conferences, to first responders, uh, multi-million dollar companies. So uh, if you're interested, we'd love to have that opportunity to talk to you about coming and speaking about leadership and about how to be successful to the people in your organization. And you also, how do people get the book? So it's on Amazon and it's available okay. in hardcover, paperback, ebook, and audible. And I, I did the reading for the audible. The only other voice on there is my wife. Uh, she did the about the author and the forward because she wrote the forward. So I, I wanted to get her on there and she'd been su such an important part of my life, allowing me to, to develop as a leader and helping me develop as a leader. And, and again, she's probably a better leader than I am. Um, and so I wanted her as a part of the book as well, but it's available on Amazon. I love it. I love it. Well, I highly encourage everybody to to connect with you, to get, you know, I'm excited. I didn't realize your book was on Audible. I'm not only going to listen to it, but I got to talk to you about how you did that because, uh, okay, you know, Man Up Already should be an audio, audio book as well. Um, but I really appreciate you being here. Um, I'm excited to know you, to be friends with you and, and just what you're, what you're after. Um, and more importantly, Oak, what you are putting out there for, um, for the next generation. I think uh, it sums up what you said. I love your mindset of we've got a, we, you know, one of the things we talk about in our financial business is educate, equip, and empower. And, um, and you're doing that big time. So thank you. Yeah, well, thanks, John. I appreciate you having me on the show. This has been great. Absolutely. Hey, thanks for listening to another episode of the Man Up Already podcast. We really do appreciate it. And I want to ask you to do a couple of things. Number one, subscribe to the podcast. Whatever platform you're listening or viewing on, subscribe to the podcast, right? Help us 
right, continue to grow by joining the community and also rate the podcast, rate the episode, right? Whatever platform you're on, you could leave a rating. Let us know your comments. Let us know your thoughts. If you can do that, we really do want your feedback. You could head on over to manupalready.com and check out our website. Uh, All the podcast episodes are on there as well. But also join our community. Sign up on our emailing list. We're going to get content out to you. There's also a free resource there for you when you do that. Um, And pass it on. Pass on the podcast. Let people know right what we're up to what we're about speak about it if you if you're a podcast enthusiast please share episodes tell people about what it is that we do uh what we do here and what you like about it and and what you don't like about it and that's that's okay as well right it's just getting the word out and then finally i want to thank um a a great sponsor of our podcast master beef jerky their their uh slogan is bold flavor tender bite if you head on over to masterbeefjerky.com they've got incredible flavors there but if you put in the coupon code m-u-a-p you will get 20 percent off your order i highly recommend you check them out master beef jerky bold flavor tender bite and a great great sponsor of the podcast until next time thanks so much for being here and we'll talk to you soon